well, good morning to all of you. And it is really my honor to be with you this morning um, to share a few thoughts. Um, I know there's a lot happening in conferences like these where you network, where you share best practice, where you pontificate on uh, theories and issues that countries face. And so um, I'm going to look at things from various perspectives, looking at it from a system perspective, country perspective, regional perspective, international perspective, and institutional perspective. Thank you again to the hosts um, uh, who are partnered to uh, organize and to deliver this conference. Thank you for having um, us, the Caribbean Examinations Council. I have two colleagues who I'm watching at, uh, with me today who are here who uh, have been part of this forum, and we really appreciate um, your being part of this um, session, the sessions where we can present. So I'm going to be presenting on the topic flexible learning and micro-credentialing in TVET uh, with a focus on sustainability in disruptive times. And so my presentation is really a reflective one. Um, and it's reflecting on the theme where I explore the issues associated with flexible learning and micro-credentialing in TVET, and I'm going to put my, where my, the hat of a policy analyst, a researcher and practitioner, um, where I, for two decades I have worked in the tertiary education sector and human resource development reforms in the Caribbean and in other jurisdictions where I participated primarily in the Middle East. I want to say that in preparation for this, I would have explored several uh, pieces of literature. Um, and you know, as academics, many of us, we tend to delve into the literature and we do our thematic analyses and we do all our quantitative research to kind of guide and gauge where we're headed. And in, for, for the most part, that helps. But when you are in practice, it really makes a difference. When you are seeing things in front of you, you are encountering learners, teachers, those persons in the classroom space who really are, in some instances, inventing things as they go along, and I think some of those inventions are important. Uh, so I would have referred to primarily three papers in my presentation. The first is called Six Principles to Advance TVET for Sustainable Development. Uh, this was published by a professor at Cardiff University, and he would have looked at six, those six principles, including what we refer to as a holistic approach in education, uh, inclusivity in terms of how we, we, we manage um, the re reforms that are taking place in, work, in the workforce and the integration of that within the education space. Responsiveness, looking at the needs of learners, needs of the individual, the needs of the communities and the countries. And of course, linking that to sustainable development. The need for permeability, in other words, how do we transit TVET across all subsectors in an education system so that we ensure that when we train persons, when we educate individuals, we have a holistic form of education that ensures that the individual leaves with the skills and competencies that are required for a changing world. And of course, the issues around tech savviness and human centeredness and uh, looking at disruptions and change uh, and a very fundamental issue that uh, many people confront in TVET is that of resources. The needed resources, the equipment, the laboratory technologies, the technolo technologies themselves that are fast changing, and how we ensure that those are interweaven into the education space. And the third paper, or the two other two papers I have looked at, um, refer to um, uh, the papers by the European Center for Vocational Development, looking at the VET toolkit for tackling early leaving, and the other is the global micro-credentialing landscape, charting a new credential ecology for lifelong learning, and that is in the Journal of Learning and Development. So in my talk, I'm going to share some thoughts about the key concepts, uh, the realities we face, and what I refer to as the global insights. Um, the Caribbean challenges we face because we are in locate, located in the Caribbean and there are unique challenges that we have found ourselves in, particularly as a result of the pandemic. I will mention some prospects and possibilities and then I will posit some key recommendations that I hope will be assistant, assist, helpful to you as you look at these issues. Key concepts, one, and this is where I explore issues associated with sustainability and disruptions and what those mean. And so for sustainability, I think we can all agree that we think futuristically as individuals, as institutions, as countries, as the globe. 
when we think of what our future generations need. And within that space, we look at the decisions we make today in education and the impact those decisions have for future generations. The 17 SDGs, ladies and gentlemen, presents a wonderful opportunity for us to reflect on the interconnectedness among all of them when we focus on Sustainable Development Goals 4 and 8. That has to do with education and lifelong learning and the quality therein and inclusivity for all, and of course the issues associated with preparing a workforce that we want to see for uh, the world ahead. And so when I speak about disruptions, I'm looking at uh, the times in which we live, but I'm also looking at the technologies that are available that would prevent us, give us the opportunity rather, to dis truly disrupt the space in education that we are confronted with. And so I talk about disturbances and interruptions, uh, whether those disturbances are interruptions as a result of catastrophic events, and we know what those are. We've been through a pandemic. We live in the Caribbean where we are vulnerable nations, where the environment is concerned. And of course, natural disasters wreak havoc on our countries regularly. And some of those, including disruptions of technology, which changes the practice, the educational practice that we engage, um, are critical for us to appreciate when we think of disruptions. And so as I look at both of them, I think of the relationship that they play in education systems. In CARICOM, we believe in what we call the seamless human resource development model. And that is a model from policy to practice that links all levels of education and ensures that the learner who is transiting from early childhood all the way to tertiary levels uh, is guaranteed an opportunity for continuity, continual learning, and for progression. And so for us, it is important to understand that we have to work towards eliminating the divide that exists between traditional education that is considered academic and technical and vocational education that is considered not to be. And so the parity of esteem that we've all, as practitioners, fought for needs to be realized now. And if not now, then it will never be um, realized within our education system. The space is there for us to put those things in place. And I'm asking that we consider that carefully. The CARICOM Human Resource Tw De uh, Development 2030 strategy speaks to that sustainability and speaks to that interconnectedness between our education subsectors and subsystems, ensuring that it truly we provide avenues and opportunities for learners to progress from level to level. And a CARICOM qualifications framework, which countries at their own levels are trying to address, pro also provides the opportunities for that seamless education system to be realized. And what that does, it helps us to define clearly the competencies and the outcomes for education at every level, from levels one to 10 in the framework, and it gives us the opportunity of assigning the credits that are needed in a credit transfer system for every level, whether those are considered to be mainstream education or te technical and vocational education, and that feeds its way into institutional planning when we are looking at putting concept that I am referring to in the next slide, um, really shows the link between flexible learning and what I refer to as competency-based credentialing. When we speak about education for sustainable development and educational disruptions, uh, it's important for us to realize that building TVET systems, whatever they might be, alternative forms of credentialing are critical. But first, we must realize that flexible learning is really about choice, it's about philosophies, it's about models, it's about systems, it's about practices at country level and at institutional level. And those must provide our learners with increased options and choices for them to progress across a system and to eliminate any op opportunities that might have been inadvertently designed in our curricula and our educational systems that creates blocks or barriers for opportunity of, of experience and for learning. And so the imp it is very important for us to look at um, the issues associated with personalized learning in which the individual learner is catered for over and above institutional-based learning. The second point I want to make with respect to competency-based credentialing is that we have to see it as a process, but also as an outcome. In that, as a process, 
we explore how the learner who is engaged in the learning experience is developing his or her competence and the assessment regime that we use is providing for formative ways for the learner to gauge how he or she is developing and progressing but at the same time giving us many opportunities and many chances for progressive learning and progressive assessment that does not deny the opportunity for the person to, to, to progress to the next level. In other words, high stakes tests, and I, yes, I'm from a Caribbean Examinations Council that has a philosophy of high stakes testing that we are remodeling, but essentially high stakes testing which places tremendous stress and, and, and trauma in the lives of learners and teachers, administrators, and policy makers has to be refashioned and refashioned now to cater for a progressive form of assessment that allows for learners to be have given the opportunity to learn and to adapt and to change. And therefore, pro as they progress from one level to the other, they are given multiple opportunities for be to be assessed. And those means multiple assessment strategies and not one, form of strategy, but at the same time, if the learner has to do some form of assessment and he or she is unable to progress beyond that, he or she is given a second and a third and possibly even a fourth choice to be able to progress and to move on from that level so that they are not left behind. And I want to make that point because I think it's important for it to be said. Some of these principles are uh, kind of espoused. Um, and so when I speak about flexible learning, as I said, at the country and institutional level, it's important for us to understand that flexible learning models need to be carefully designed. And those models require us to think about carefully the philosophy, the strategies, the policies, the procedures we are putting in place to support our institutional goals but at the same time to contribute to individualized education and opportunities where training are concerned. And the opportunities for us to mix or provide a mechanism where in-school education is relatable and understood within the context of the community and the workforce. So that when we are teaching, we teach not as isolated practitioners, but we teach with the practitioners in the real world and bring those experts into the classroom space so that the students are not disadvantaged. And by the time they leave that educational space, they would have had sufficient opportunities to grow, to understand the world in which they live, and obviously to make contributions in a very meaningful way. And secondly, it's important for us to also understand that we need to explore alternative pathways. I know here in Jamaica, the government of Jamaica has been certainly exploring these alternative pathway options, as are many other countries in the Caribbean in their own way. And this is very important for us to de detect and understand what this means institutionally. Uh, and policy needs to be carefully linked to the practices in the school so that evidence-based research from within the school setting, primarily from a curricular perspective, needs to be contextualized within the context of the policy so the policy is not being, taking the institutions in a, in a space that they're not prepared for, that the teachers are trained um, to deliver competency-based education and training, and of course that the partnerships that are within the school facilitate competency-based education and training. And so for us, the modalities, the modes, and the approaches for alternative pathways need to be considered. And we need to encourage, emphasize, recognize, certify, and accredit formal, informal, and non-formal learning within those spaces. It cannot be that the school has a curriculum that is treating with some aspects of what is, it sees as being necessary within the education landscape, but it's not carefully linked to what the real world is doing. And I've said that before. The other point I want to make with respect to flexible learning, it's important for us to understand that learners need to do, develop, and of course acquire the credentials that are important. And this is where I'm going to be speaking to micro-credentialing because what we tend to do is structure macro qualifications or credentials that are designed within a curriculum that is institutionalized based on an economic model for allowing timetables that are, uh, that, that, are, that are institutionalized and it does not allow for the options for the learner to be part of the process to negotiate their own learning within the classroom space and the parent 
um, with, who is working with that pupil to also be part of that process. How we do that is going to be important when we think about the options that are available. And one of those we have to pay attention to is prior learning assessment and recognition, which I know all as practitioners you all advocate for, but how we weave that into the curriculum design, how we weave that into the assessment approach is very fundamental but also critical to ensure that the learners are progressing and are progressing well, that what has been done before is recognized and it is not seen as an appendage or an add-on to the, to the curriculum. If we do not allow for that in the context of education, we are going to find disenfranchised learners, disenfranchised parents, and disenfranchised um, teachers who are going to find that students are moving at different paces in this classroom in a cohort where some will be advantaged and some will be disadvantaged. In the next slide, I'm speaking to it from a systems perspective when we talk about flexible education systems. And flexible education systems, as I mentioned, really look at a number of different pieces that are all connected. This diagram, which is uh, courtesy um, the European Center for Vocational Development, addresses changing pathways for learners that have to be institutionalized, the issue of enrollment or admittance, and how we manage that at multiple levels in the system. The using the alternatives which I've men mentioned before in terms of construction of curriculum, but more importantly, what we refer to as grading decisions. Are we giving letter grades, number grades, or are we assessing persons based on competency? And if we are doing that, how does that equate with the official or formal systems of education that we have been accustomed? accustomed to, where grades are assigned based on a score. Those things are things that have to be carefully considered. And of course, the modality for flexible learning and what we call institutionalized programs for learners need to be considered in the education and training system. That is flexible, that caters for all options. The next slide really speaks to some global insights, which I'm going to speak to very quickly. And for us at Caribbean Examinations Council, we have taken a global and a regional look at what has been happening over the last two or three years, um, and my team has been paying a considerable amount of attention, attention to the triggers for change in education and in curricula, and we have uh, found that um, the, these global insights in the next slide um, present us with an opportunity to consider what those are. And so I have four categories of global insights, what I refer to as Society 5.0, where we are talking about a super intelligent planet that is linked to sustainable development. I spoke to the goals before, and how we create a sustainable smart society, um, and where the machines and human intelligence interact in that process as we consider what we do in the world that is rapidly changing. The technologies play a very important part. The second global insight has to do with what the World Economic Forum has uh, been put in place over the last five years regarding the future of jobs um, reports and the skills and competencies that are required, primarily what is, is referred to as a transferable skills, but now we refer to as transversal skills that are defined by UNESCO, and how those are considered when we are designing and developing outcomes for learning and curricula that are competency-based. And the, the third global insight that is there looks at um, the need for adapting to a rapidly changing workforce. And so the workforce wants persons who are coming out with certifiable skills that are not with too much longevity in terms of the credentialing process. And so three years may not be sufficient time for the workforce to be able to, be to have guarantees of having a certified worker or a certified individual who is employable. And so the, it is important for us to recognize that our education systems are unresponsive to those needs, that we have to uh, certainly ensure that there's rapidity and agility in how we manage those in our education systems. And the fourth refers to what we call future schooling. Um, in the CARICOM, we have what is called the new school model, which has been designed to cater for a variety of uh, contexts for learning. That model is predicated on a sustainable development approach. It's also predicated on a technological um, approach that allows for curriculum to be seen as a fle being flexible within the school. So the school is a lifelong learning uh, space. It does not only cater to uh, students who are uh, in the primary education system or the secondary education system, et cetera. The next slide 
um, speaks to some of the realities that we found in the Caribbean. And I'm going to do this very quickly because I know we are all familiar. We know that we've come through a crisis. We know that the pandemic has taught us a lot about our adaptability and our paucity of systems that are in place to cater for flexibility. We do know from the pandemic also that policymakers and educational practices, practitioners are trying to create that narrative around curricula that allows us to be more purposeful, that allows us to be more flexible, and that allows us to reconceptualize what we do with our learners. And we do know also that some of our own certification and examination systems, of which we are part, have to change to recognize the kinds of competencies that we want in our learners. And so the skills gap that exists is fundamental to changing education in terms of how we construct our education practices in the school sector. And, 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 and I want to say this because it's important for universities, colleges, vocational institutions, schools and all to appreciate that if we um, see ourselves as being isolated in the conversation and doing our own thing in our own spaces, we will not solve the problem. We have to manage that uh, discussion together and we have to come to a compromise in terms of what we want in curricula. The next slide really is just saying that we really are at a place where we do not want to be headed to a dead end in our education and delivery, training, and, delivery and training systems. Are we at that place? And if we are, how do we re-engineer? How do we innovate? Or how do we disrupt the education space to using the myriad of possibilities that all of you wonderful people in here have been talking about over the last few days. Uh, the, the brain power for that change is in this room and others who are in other rooms in this conference. And it is you are the ones who are going to consider the options that are best suited for the spaces and the institutions that you serve, the learners who come to those institutions, but more importantly, to help policymakers who try their very best to understand the context of education um, and the changes that are happening to be able to make those changes in policy. Next slide. So I'm going to speak to some possibilities quickly and prospects. And the first thing I want to say is that it's important for us to understand when we speak about new forms of credentialing, what we are talking about. So what is it? What is it? it is a really having structured learning paths that are accessible. In other words, Whatever curricula you put in place, whether they are within an academic institution, a TVET institution, they're in the workforce, and they're designed by and the employers, those must have clearly defined accessible learning paths. That is to say the learner must know what, it, what he or she is invested in, and the learner must also know what, how he or she is being assessed to gain the skills and competencies that you want them to acquire. And the other point that I've said before it is important for us to recognize when we talk about new credentialing that we ensure that we do not just see it as additional, alternative, complementary, or as some refer to as prior learning. All of those terminologies have to now be mainstreamed in our definitions. Otherwise, we will find ourselves seeing, constructing more than one curricula in institutions, so you have a degree program, and then you have continuing ed, or professional development, or lifelong learning, whatever you call it, and the individual learner is confronted with all of these options trying to decipher where do I go, and why do I go in this pathway, and what does this present to me in terms of my future? We have to be mindful of that. The other point I want to make, and I've said this before, when we think about alternative credentialing, as it's referred to, or new, or new credentialing, I prefer to refer to it as, we have to recognize that the education paradigm is obsolete. We have to recognize that we are confronted with technological changes through industry 4.0 and 5.0, and how do we manage those within our education space? We need to recognize that the workforce is requiring, a, there's a high demand for new credentials. In fact, there are studies that have been done by the World Bank, by ILO, by the United States Department of Labor, who have shown that there's a decreasing de uh, interest in degrees, associate degrees included, and there's an increasing interest in shorter stackable certifications. How does that weave its way into this conversation so that we can put those structures in place quickly? 
And then, of course, the importance for workforce development, looking at ensuring that new credentialing is a part of the formal education landscape for matriculation, and it allows persons to contribute to civil society. So they're not just seen as, I'm going through this, this learning, and I'm doing this for work, but I'm becoming civil, civil enlightened, and I'm going to contribute to the advancement as a constructive citizen in my country or my region. So those are some of the things that we need to think about. The next slide depicts what I refer to as a credential ecology. And this, courtesy the um, Commonwealth of Learning um, and some Scottish researchers would have predicated or de de designed uh, an ecology framework, and it's in a paper that I mentioned earlier, that, uh, that was designed by or prepared by Dublin City University. It really speaks to two principal factors for determining the credential. And those two principal factors are essentially this. Are they bundled or unbundled or debundled is the other word that is used. In other words, can we stack the credentials in smaller bits or into larger chunks? And how do we do that? And can we offer individuals the opportunity to take smaller bits, get smaller credentials, and stack them so they get a larger credential? And how does that work its way into credit allocation? How does that work its way into accreditation? Those are the issues that we have to discuss when we talk about stackability in, in credentialing. The second principle, which is also there, has to do with what we call as the award, the type of award, and the credits around those awards. So whether we talk about macro-credentials or micro-credentials, whichever one we use, there are systems in place in various countries. Canada has one, New Zealand has one, Australia has one, the United States is putting one in place. There are other contexts um, the UK has that is looking at how we assign credits for micro-credentials. And there's a quality assurance framework that governs how that is being done. I know that in Jamaica, it's something that is attracting attention. My own country, Trinidad and Tobago, has been, I, in fact, I was working on it when I was the head of the accrediting agency there. And there are others who are doing that across the Caribbean. What are we doing about quality assurance and accreditation of programs where micro-credentials are, are mainstream now? And so policies need to be established. Systems and frameworks need to be put in place. The next slide kind of breaks this down a little bit more to show you a typology of a micro-credential. And I'm not sure if you can see all of it, but essentially the typology which is depicted in this diagram speaks to how we go about developing technical skills and transferable skills or transversal skills in a structured program. And so the options are there are six principles that you can consider. What is the purpose of the micro-credential? Is it a pathway to receive a formal qualification? Is it a qualification in itself? Um, is it a means of updating your knowledge in a previous one? Is it a means for you to gain new knowledge and technical skills um, that are acquired? And how do we assess those? The second has to do with the mode of delivery, whether or not it is being done in person, because there are micro-credentials that are face-to-face. Um, previously, we referred to them as continuing education courses or professional development courses. Um, and for some, this is a new term, but they all mean essentially the same thing in terms of design. Uh, how is that done? Is it done primarily face-to-face? -face? Is it purely on online? Or do we use a mixed approach, a hybrid approach to offerings? The third principle has to do with the flexibility, and there's that word again. Is it fa a fixed pace, cohort-based approach in terms of how we deliver it? Is it that it's self-paced, so it's, the onus is on the learner to participate in the learning with clearly designed rubrics, tools, guidance for engaging the learner with the asynchronous or synchronous opportunities for learning in that structure, or is it a combination of the two? The fourth has to be the mechanism of the interaction between the learner and the facilitator or instructor, or whoever that sage on the stage is um, in, the, in that space. Uh, does it allow for cohort-based learning? Or is it independent, or is it both? And the fifth has to do with the form of the credential. Because credentials, for the most part, and are trusted, for the most part, as being issued as paper-based credentials. But are we using digital forms? Are we issuing digital badges? What do those digital, digital badges mean within a social and space online? What do those digital badges mean for the individual who accumulates them and stacks them? Those are conversations we need to have. 
And the sixth has to do with the indicator of achievement. That is, um, has the learner mastered the skill having participated in the course or the credential? Is there demonstrated competence? What does that look like when you are assessing? And of course, how do we use that and accumulate that in a system? So my next slide, um, um, I'm gonna go through this very quickly to the end, um, really speaks to what we at CXE have been focused on over the last year. Um, so we have introduced what is called a qualifications management framework, where we've aligned all our qualifications in a structure that is credit-based. So for every qualification, there will be, for a macro qual or qualification, there will be credits issued, but individuals can stack them through a micro-credentialing approach, which we are designing at the moment, that is based on what is posited there as what we refer to as a CXE skills and competency matrix. It's a typology of, of skills that focuses on five themes, and for each theme, there are three sub-themes, and this is going to be used in our curricula as we revise all our curricula, and this is going to be used as we develop new qualifications. In fact, we have a new qualification that we've been developing that we're going to go to market soon on here in Jamaica, and that is in fact based on the skills and competencies identified therein. Now, just indicating those are themes and sub-themes, and there are 115 skills aligned to all of those that I've mentioned. The way to do it, ladies and gentlemen, that we are approaching is we have those outcomes for learning based on our qualification structure. We are mapping those skills against national curricula to see alignment, and then we are filling the gaps based on a product innovation model we've devised to deliver it in country. I'm not going to go into the details, but just to say that's the approach we are using. And these have been pegged against several frameworks, including the UNESCO Transversal Skills Framework. The next um, slide kind of shows you how we are going about the stacking. And so CXE has developed a digital um, uh, space for a wallet of credentials, and that is going to be designed, it's being designed in a way that allows for individuals to acquire digital badges and to have those stacked um, online with our e-certification or e-credential um, um, models. And so it allows the individual to pursue an award, to pursue a mic uh, stack those awards where digital badges are attained, acquire micro-credentials based on a set of skills within the sub-theme of skills that we have designed. And then we move to the in an intermediary qualification or intermediate qualification, and then of course a macro credential or macro qualification. Just to say, for example, if you take an associate degree, which is two years, to acquire the macro qualification, that will, acquire, that will be based on a set number of credits that we've designed. But if you choose to, to take a certain number of courses within the, the framework, as opposed to doing the entire qualification, you can uh, bundle those and acquire your intermediary credentials, your micro-credentials, or your just simply your nano-credentials. And it allows you to mix and match. And if you do a mix and match approach, we're going to have a bespoke category that allows you to be able to leave with a qualification that is designed for you. So it's not um, structured in a way where you must do this, do that. Once you meet the number, minimum number of credits and you've, you've done the minimum number of assessments and you have as, as shown that you've acquired the skills in the various categories, you will therefore be um, able to uh, leave with a, some type of qualification. But just to say that as we think about our future proofing of TVET, it is important for us to consider, as I mentioned before, the parity of esteem that we've been talking about to be designed in a particular way. And for us at the Caribbean Examinations Council, and for the, in the Caribbean as a whole, the conversations over the years have been on competency-based education and training. And to use a competency-based approach in our design, the CARICOM qualifications framework allows for that. And of course, with all the learning, five learning domains in the qualifications framework and the associated competencies at all the 10 levels, you could now, at a program level, take those, design your outcomes for learning based on the competencies that are there, and therefore set some competency standards. You design your curriculum and you work out the equivalencies within the framework. It allows you to be able to move um, either an upward direction, a diagonal direction, or in a horizontal way from one curriculum to the other so the learner is not left behind. There are options for them in the system. It allows also for how we integrate technology. I want to say, though, that when we are considering 
competency-based education and training, or what we at CXC, you just went a little too fast, competency-based education and training um, uh, and assessment models, it is critical that we address the gender gap, okay? We have to understand that persons have been attracted to certain uh, professions, certain types of training based on gender. And so the approach we use to allow for persons to acquire transversal skills in which we train them in the particular occupations is important so that everyone acquires those broad sets of skills that I was referring to earlier, and therefore, uh, whether you're male or female, and we give people the opportunity based on their performance levels, based on their learning styles, based on their the, the opportunities that they have in their particular communities and their schools, uh, that those chances to progress. And so technology integration is important, and I've referred to some of the educational technologies, which I'm not going to go into because of time, and I know many of you are familiar with them, to consider how we progress what I will say in the list on the lineup is that obviously for many of us, uh, the fifth, I think, the fifth seems to be the one that is predominantly of interest. How we navigate the artificial intelligence space. Um, many have been very much preoccupied with chat GPT and other, there are 44 we have counted, um, other related or relatable technologies that are either out or in the pipeline that we have to pay attention to that will affect education. And what we do in terms of our preparedness, in terms of the, 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 the policies we have in place, in terms of the procedures and protocols for quality assurance in our institutions, allowing these technologies to be used, but at the same time giving opportunity for ensuring that the ethics of education is protected, to ensuring the integrity of education is protected and the quality is done uh, properly is important for us to consider. And I know we all know, know all of this. And so in our design of curricula, in our assessment regimes and strategies and our toolkits, we need to find ways to be able to address those particular issues now. Because um, as fast as we go, people are finding um, all kinds of opportunities to take advantage of the education that is presented before them. And if we are not in a space to, um, to deal with that, uh, and I don't know the solutions to all of them, I'm, I'm, I must admit, um, we, we need to definitely have um, that considered and at the forefront of our policies. And just to say that a quality assuring micro-credentials, as I mentioned before, is important. I'm not sure if you're seeing it's uh, actually a cycle. Um, but I've tried to depict here six um, different um, components that I think are important when we are considering how we design, develop, and deliver, and quality assure micro-credential. And this is based on some research that I've done, but it's also based on a model that I put in place when I was working at a previous organization accrediting agency when we were working on quality assurance of micro-credentials, and I've shared some of this, these ideas with the university, um, sorry, with the um, uh, JTEC and Jamaica Tertiary Education Commission as they've been looking at some of this. And just to say that it's important for us to appreciate that we need to consider the market research to justify the demand for the micro-credential. Are we clear of what the competencies or skills are? Do we know why those competencies or skills are in demand? Are th is there a re labor requirement? Um, and which industries are requiring it and in what numbers? Is it current or is it future focused? Is it a skill that is going to be needed now? Is it something that we're going to need five years from now? And what are we doing to prepare persons for the ch rapid changes that we anticipate are going to happen five or 10 years from now? Of course, it's important in the design um, of the micro-credential. We have a system governing how we construct carefully. And I shared the six um, principles or six components of design of a micro-credential previously. How do we use that in concept conceptualizing our design of our system in our institutions? It is important for us to also look at mechanisms and procedures for development and approval, because quite often this needs to, there needs to be a match between labor and education. And how we manage that conversation, do we get uh, committees um, comprising of persons in the institution and um, those who are in industry to review and approve those micro-credentials? And if they do, who are they and what do they contribute to that discourse? Is it that you're developing micro-credentials for industry that is going to be serving a particular need or niche? And if you are, 
what are the regulatory requirements, but equally so, what is the invested interest of that industry in your institution? And it must materialize in terms of a partnership that has material reward. So how do you manage that is very important to allow for quality, but at the same time allow for strategic partnerships. And you, one needs to also understand that you have to manage the learning, and we went through some of those before, the assessment approach and the certification, and of course, there must be strict protocols for quality assurance. Um, so is that a quality assurance model for the institution that you've adopted? Or is there a separate quality assurance model for micro-credentialing? Or if your quality assurance model is di different, how do they speak to each other to ensure that when you're developing and awarding micro-credentials in one space, it's recognized in the other? So ladies and gentlemen, the last thing I'm going to say to you, and I promise I'll end now, I'm sorry for boring you for all this time, is just simply to say that it is important for us to posit where we go. And I have three basic recommendations. That's all I have, nothing more in my basket, unfortunately. And the first is important for us to concept conceptualize institutionally how we design our micro-credentials and if we are awarding nano-credentials within the TVET space. If you are a TVET institution, what does that look like for you when you work with industry or the workforce? If you are an academic institution, how do you incorporate that in your curricular design? The second has to do with what I refer to as future-proofing TVET using research-based models. And there are a lot of people here who are excellent researchers, better than me by far, and you know what they are. And we're expecting you to bring some of those insights into the conversation to look at the possibilities of, uh, of models and educational technologies to future-proof TVET. That is, how do we make it sustainable? How do we prepare for further future disruptions in terms of the catas catastrophes that I mentioned earlier, or in terms of if we are looking at uh, emerging things that create a disruptive space for us otherwise? I mean, there's competition, for example. How do we treat with competition in the global space, in an online space, in an e-learning space, which is sometimes unregulated? And therefore, our learners are now confronted with all of these options. And so how do we prepare for that? And of course, the last is what I said in the, in the end. We need to look at validating quality assuring and recognizing micro-credentials. And I would dare say that all of these can be managed at the institutional level, the school level, the community level, or at the country level. Or, if you wish, like me, at the regional level. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time.